On November 9, 1971, a man killed his wife, his mother, and all of their young children at their home in Westfield, New Jersey, and then completely vanished into thin air. He had planned the murder so meticulously that nearly a month passed before anyone suspected that anything was amiss. It was only almost after two decades that this man, living under a new identity, in a new city, with a new family, was found and apprehended. It's the epitome of the perfect crime, almost. It's also one of the most bizarre cases of someone committing a gruesome homicide and then vanishing off the face of the earth, only to be recaptured many years later. In today's video, we are gonna dive deeper into the story and not just learn more about this man, but also learn what drove him to commit such heinous crimes and whether he'd do it again if given the chance. But the icing on the cake is how he was captured after evading every law enforcement agency in the United States for almost two decades. Regardless of what you may think about this heinous crime, this is one of the most fascinating cases I've come across in a long time. Born in Bay City, Michigan, John List was the only child of German-American parents, John Frederick List and Alma Barbara Florence List. Like his father, List was a devout Lutheran and a Sunday school teacher. The year before his father's death, in 1944, Liz graduated from Bay City Central High School. In 1943, he enlisted in the United States Army and served as a laboratory technician during World War II. After his discharge in 1946, he enrolled at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he earned a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's degree in accounting, and was commissioned a second lieutenant through the ROTC. In November 1950, as the Korean War escalated, Liz was recalled to active military service. At Fort Eustis, Virginia, he met Helen Morris Taylor, who would go on to be his future wife and the mother of his children. They married on December 1st, 1951, in Baltimore, Maryland. After completion of his second tour in 1952, List worked for an accounting firm in Detroit and then as an audit supervisor at a paper company in Kalamazoo, where his three children were born. By 1959, Liz had risen to general supervisor of the company's accounting department, but Helen, an alcoholic, had become increasingly unstable. By the 1960s, things were going well for Liz and his family. In 1960, Liz moved to Rochester, New York to take a job with Xerox. There, he eventually became Director of Accounting Services. Five years later, Liz accepted a position as Vice President and Comptroller at a bank in New Jersey and moved with his wife, children and mother into Breeze Knoll, a 19-room Victorian mansion at 431 Hillside Avenue in Westfield. On November 5, 1971, four days before the massacre, List asked his family how they would want their remains handled after their death. That question, and the subsequent answer to it, would prove to be very prescient. On November 9th, just before his killing rampage began, 
Liz left a note for the milkman to cancel delivery. Then, without wasting another moment, he went into the kitchen and shot his wife in the jaw. Without moving her body, Liz went to his mother's third floor apartment and shot her in the left eye. As his daughter Patricia, 16, and younger son Frederick, 13, arrived home from school, Liz shot each one of them in the back of the head. After making himself lunch, Liz drove to his bank to close both his and his mother's bank accounts, and then to Westfield High School to watch his elder son John Frederick, 15, play in a soccer game. After driving his eldest son home, Liz shot him repeatedly. He found it necessary because his elder son managed to put on a defense before being overpowered. Liz placed the bodies of his wife and children in sleeping bags in the mansion's ballroom. He left his mother's body in her apartment in the attic. In a five-page letter to his pastor, which was found on the desk in his study room, Liz claimed that he saw too much evil in the world and he had killed his family to save their souls. He then cleaned the various crime scenes, removed his own picture from all family photographs in the house, tuned the radio to a religious station and departed. It speaks to Liz's meticulous planning that the murders were not discovered until almost a month later, December the 7th. While that was mostly because of the family's reclusive tendencies, Liz sent notes to the children's schools and part-time jobs, claiming that the children would be visiting their ailing maternal grandmother in North Carolina for a few weeks. Helen's mother was in fact ill and had canceled the visit to Westfield because of it. Had she made the trip, Liz later said, she would have been his sixth victim. Liz ensured that no one would stop by the house for any reason. He stopped milk, mail, and newspaper deliveries. The weakest link ended up being something Liz had no control over, the neighbors. Eventually, they started to notice that all of the mansion's room were illuminated day and night, but with no apparent activity within the house. After light bulbs began burning out one by one, they called the police. Officers entered through an unlocked window leading to the basement and discovered the family's bodies. Westfield, where few violent crimes had been recorded since 1963, received national attention as the site of the most notorious crime in New Jersey. Police launched an investigation and a nationwide manhunt was launched to find John List. While the police initially received hundreds of leads, none of them would prove useful. Police also had their work cut out for them when they discovered that all reliable photographs of List had been destroyed. Although the family card was parked at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport, police didn't believe that List had boarded a flight. The family mansion, Breeze Knoll, remained empty until it was destroyed by a fire in August of 1972, nine months after the murders. Destroyed along with the home was the ballroom stained glass skylight, rumored to be a signed Tiffany original, worth at least $100,000 at that time, which is equivalent to more than $650,000 in present-day dollars. Although the destruction was officially ruled arson, police have not been able to find any suspects or persons of interest who may have been directly or indirectly responsible. After studying all the evidence and exhausting all the leads, police eventually reached a dead end and had essentially given up looking for lists. 
Fast forward 17 years to 1989. That's when the New Jersey prosecutors had come up with a new plan. They had an expert forensic artist, Frank Bender, create a physical bust of John List as Bender imagined he might have aged. Bender gave him a hawk nose, grizzled eyebrows, and horned rimmed glasses. Psychologists and criminal profilers working for law enforcement theorized that List would wear the same spectacles he wore as a younger man to remind them of the more successful days. The accurate profiling and age progression combined with what happened next proved to be the massive breakthrough in the case. In May of 1989, the 18-year-old crime was covered on the Fox television program America's Most Wanted during its very first year on the air. The segment featured an age-progressed clay bust, sculpted by forensic artist Frank Bender, which turned out to bear a close resemblance to List's actual appearance. On June 1st, less than two weeks after the broadcast, List was arrested at a Richmond accounting firm after a Denver neighbor recognized the description and alerted the authorities. So where did Liz go after committing the murders, and what was he doing all this time? In 1971, as the FBI discovered, Liz had traveled by train from New Jersey to Michigan, and then to Colorado. He settled in Denver in the early 1972, and took an accounting job under the name Robert Peter Bob Clark, named for one of his college classmates. From 1979 to 1986, he was the controller at a paper box manufacturer outside Denver. He joined a Lutheran congregation and ran a carpool for Shutton Church members. At one religious gathering, he met an army PX clerk named Dolores Miller and married her in 1985. In February of 1988, the couple moved to a house in the Brander Mill neighborhood of Midlothian, Virginia, where List, still using the name Bob Clark, resumed work as an accountant at a small firm. When List was apprehended and arrested, he continued to stand by his alias for several months, even after his extradition to Union County, New Jersey in late 1989. But finally, faced with irrefutable evidence, including a fingerprint match with List military records, and then with evidence found at the crime scene, he finally confessed his true identity on February 16, 1990. That year, John List went on trial for five counts of first-degree murder. Confidentiality between a minister and his parishioners applies to List. Earlier, the judge allowed other letters admitted as evidence in the murder trial, and News 4's Gloria Rojas reports from Elizabeth, New Jersey. John List's attorney claimed that when the police entered the List house in Westfield and discovered the five bodies of his family, the police were violating List's constitutional rights. This is the type of search that is precluded that should be precluded under the Constitution. That Elijah Miller maintains that without a search warrant, the police had no right to enter the house, that List had not abandoned his house, and therefore, the prosecution isn't entitled to use as evidence the notes John List left behind. But Judge William Wertheimer allowed the material into evidence. Anyone who doubts his intent to abandon all that he had forsaken need only conjure a mental image of the Fendant being returned to New Jersey under an assumed name in leg irons and handcuffs and refer to the factual findings infra. There can be no clearer portrait of a person who has abandoned his past. One of the notes allowed into evidence is a letter to Helen List's mother, 
whose daughter and three grandchildren had been murdered. And it reads, at this time, I know that they were all Christians. I couldn't be sure of that in the future as the children grew up. Another note was to the sister of his 84-year-old mother, who was also killed in the house. He wrote in part, To save mother untold anguish over that result, I felt it best that she be relieved from this veil of tears. And in the midst of the massacre on November 9th, John List, the careful planner, tied up some loose ends in business when he wrote to a business associate about the best prospects for a quick sale. Despite their bizarre nature, the defense didn't want the letters in evidence. The defense, however, will be based on mental defect. But one letter in particular has its own battle in court. John List left a written explanation for Reverend Eugene Raywinkle, his pastor. The defense says that communication is protected by the special confidentiality between a priest or pastor and the penitent. So is your testimony that you regarded that letter to be confidential? Absolutely. Pursuant to what privilege? Pastor, parishioner, priest, penitent. More witnesses will be heard tomorrow on the priest penitent issue. Then the judge will decide whether that controversial telling letter will be part of the evidence the jury hears. Gloria Rojas, News 4, New Jersey. The letter to the pastor allegedly goes into details about List's motives. More with During the trial, he showed no guilt, remorse, or regret for the murder of his entire family. The lawyers who defended List claim he had been struggling with PTSD after he had fought in World War II and the Korean War. Psychologists also revealed that List committing the mass murder was an extreme reaction to a midlife crisis, which prosecutors reinforced was not an excuse for five people to lose their lives. On April 12, 1990, List was convicted of five counts of first-degree murder. At his sentencing hearing, he denied direct responsibility for his actions. I feel that because of my mental state at that time, I was unaccountable for what happened. I ask all affected by this for their forgiveness, understanding, and prayer, said List. The judge, however, was unpersuaded. John Emil List is without remorse and without honor, he said. After 18 years, 5 months, and 22 days, it is now time for the voices of Helen, Alma, Patricia, Frederick, and John F. List to rise from the grave, the judge continued. List was imposed a sentence of five terms of life imprisonment to be served consecutively, the maximum permissible penalty at the time. After his conviction, List filed an appeal on grounds that his judgment had been impaired by post-traumatic stress disorder due to his military service. He also argued that the letter he left behind at the crime scene, essentially his confession, was a confidential communication to his pastor and therefore inadmissible as evidence. A federal appeals court rejected both arguments. Once convicted and put behind bars, List eventually expressed a degree of remorse for his crimes. I wish I had never done what I did, he said during a TV interview in 2002. I've regretted my action and prayed for forgiveness ever since. When asked why he had not taken his own life, he said he believed that suicide would have prevented him from going to heaven, where he hoped to be reunited with his family. 
In March of 2008, Liz died of complications from pneumonia while imprisoned at St. Francis Medical Center in Trenton, New Jersey. He was 82 years old. In 2008, in reporting his death, the New Jersey Star Ledger referred to him as the boogeyman of Westfield. Liz's mother, Alma, was interred at the St. Lawrence Lutheran Cemetery in Michigan. Helen and her three children were buried at Fairview Cemetery in Westfield, New Jersey. On an interesting note, prior to his arrest in 1989, List was considered a suspect for being D.B. Cooper, a robber who hijacked Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305, receiving $200,000 in ransom and four parachutes before jumping out of the plane's rear exit door, never to be seen again. The hijacking and robbery occurred less than three weeks after List disappeared, with the theory being that he had committed the crime for the money while on the run. List denied being Cooper, who remains unidentified to this day. And there was no direct evidence that implicates him. Subsequently, he has been cleared as a suspect. Ultimately, it is difficult to believe that not only such a gruesome crime had occurred, but that the perpetrator almost got away with it. Indeed, it was almost the perfect crime. However, one thing that brings closure to that thought is that this was back in the 70s, before the internet, before the 24-hour news cycle, and before instant communication, genetic genealogy, and biometric passports. It's hard to fathom that such a crime might occur in this day and age. Yet an eerily similar event had occurred in recent times. In 2011, in Northwest France, a man allegedly murdered his entire family, killing his wife, four children, and two dogs and then buried their bodies under the house before disappearing without a trace. Not only are the two killings similar, but so is what happened before the actual crime. Everything was meticulously planned, with no one hearing anything, and the bodies not being discovered until much later. At the time of filming this video, this man has not been found and police have no clue about his whereabouts. 